what is, I think the most beautiful, like, you know, like value add of like have, having anything on chain is the fact that like you will see people building on top of it, right? And this could be like anything from like the and the entire game state being fully on chain or just like, you know, the NFT being on chain. Like you will see emergent behavior form around anything that is like, you know, on chain data. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that like Dan and I, you believe the future of finance is on the blockchain. And we're excited that London is becoming a global hub for blockchain innovation and institutional adoption of digital assets. That's why we're pumped to host the 2024 Digital Asset Summit in London this March. Don't miss your chance to get ahead of the curve. Later in this episode, we'll tell you how you can save 20% off on your ticket. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. We are super excited for today's episode. We've got Scott Sinatra the founder and CEO at Argus Labs. And for those who aren't familiar, Argus is a game development company that's also building infrastructure for uh, game developers to more easily build fun games. So Scott, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. So congrats on the launch of Dark Frontier, first of all. I played it and it's really awesome. I got to number one on the leaderboard actually after like seven hours of grinding after work and then woke up the next day and uh, Yannick uh, left me with like two to three small little planets. So I was like barely even still active in the game. So got really yeah. unlucky there. <laughs> but yeah. how's the launch been so far? Yeah, it's been a lot of, uh, it's been really great. Of course, like we had like a lot of like, um, like users who are interested and like funnily enough, we've only like basically invited like a small chunk of people that like pre-registered for like, like kind of like our round. And so like, um, and so like, yeah, it's been great. We learned kind of like a lot in kind of like a process. We were able to like really kind of like, I think like really try to push the limit of like what our kind of like, you know, basically new uh, infrastructure able to do. Um, and like, yeah, that's like basically kind of like, um, like kind of like, you know, been a very exciting past two weeks. Um, and like, yeah, I think in general, kind of just like love to just like see people having fun, um, kind of like playing your game. Um, and like, of course, I think like in your case, like you had to face the unfortunate reality that like you're facing like, like literally the undisputed goat of like, you know, like basically kind of the game. Um, and so like, um, and so like. And so like, yeah, but like, you know, otherwise like glad you had like a nice seven hours before uh, that happens. <laughs> no, yeah, it was really cool. I was honestly just really impressed with like the, uh, the UX of like getting onboarded. And I want to dive a little deeper into that architecture a little later, but if, if you could start out and be as frank as you possibly can, how would you kind of like describe the current state of the gaming space in crypto? Like you've got the really popular OG one Axie Infinity, and then you've got Immutable X building kind of like more at the infrastructure layer, and you got Alluvium, Parallel Prime. Like, just what's your honest opinion on most of these games? Yeah, um, I think like I've, I've I've been like kind of like around and see um, crypto gaming space evolve um, from like kind of like very really or very early days that like Crypto Kitties, and I think like um, I, I think like nowadays like you wouldn't really think about Crypto Kitties as a game, but like when Crypto Kitties first came out, that was really kind of I think the first spark of like um, what I we think like you know crypto game uh, could be right. I think that's really kind of where the discussion really came into into being, and I think like people see the axi uh, sorry the Crypto Kitties like uh, breeding as like some form of a game onto itself, right? Um, and so that was like kind of basically um, what we kind of like. I think like that was what really I think like started it all for some people. Um, and I think it's, uh, like over time, like, you know, like um, I think the like, games like Dark Forest came along where kind of like became like kind of the category defining like kind of like fully on chain games that eventually like um, like things like Axie came along with play to earn and so on and so forth. Right. Um, I think like in my opinion so far is that I think like a lot of these things, um, I think like leads into this like kind of like weird cargo called um, kind of like mania uh, every single time, right? I think like every time there's this new paradigm or this new ways of like, or even like a new playbook of like building crypto games, um, like we see people like just like fascinate around like this new like um, cool tool primitive. Um, and it ended up just like copy and pasting that formula, right? Um, and I think basically we see this with like X Infinity uh, the moment that like, oh, like, you know, play to earns have like some sort of like traction, um, like p everyone copy and pasted like the play to earn two token model um, and like uh, which ended up like not working very well. Like it was like one of the like biggest regrets that a lot of company does like in crypto gaming and it ended up pivoting to something else like afterwards, right? Either you get completely burned out and they just like pivot back to web two, uh, which is you're starting to see right now, which is like insane. Um, 
And then like some of them just like now pivots to like, you know, like fully on chain game and whatsoever. Right. And so like, um, I think like crypto gaming is like one of those categories in crypto where there's kind of like, um, like a huge identity crisis. Um, like typically gaming have been like this, like very, um, kind of like basically like playbook driven kind of like industry. Um, like, you know, like people gaming is like very, very hard industry to like be in. It's like very hit driven. And so people do whatever it takes to like kind of de-risk their product. Right. And so like, this comes into like, this is like why if you go to like app store, um, you see so many match tree games, right? Like, you know, like these formula get keeps getting repeated because like people in games are like, you know, very fascinated and they're very kind of obsessed with frameworks. Um, the unfortunate reality here is that um, there is no playbook and there, there, like, I think even so far, I just like don't see there being a playbook or framework for crypto games, right? And so the only thing that you can do and the best way to position yourself really in crypto games is to like really figure out how you can push the plot and kind of like, you know, basically discover this like playbook yourselves. The moment that you kind of find yourself like cargo culting or just doing the thing that you don't really understand, you're just kind of following the wave. Um, I think that's like really the part where you kind of like really get sucked into this vortex that you no longer have control over, right? Like you just like ended up like, oh, if this thing's like pans out, it's great. But if like most most of the times, like things don't pan out. And like, because we are such in the early days of like crypto games, like the only way that I think like you could survive is to like um, spend a lot of time doing research, right? And this comes into like building a lot of these like infrastructure yourself, right? Um, like it is the reality that a lot of the things that I think um, like, is like people obsess about in crypto games are really kind of just like basically the lowest of bar. Like, I think like we're fascinated about like, you know, like social login and like seamless onboarding. Like um, these are really kind of like table stakes, right? This shouldn't be like a goal that we aspire to be. These are really kind of just like table stakes for us to even be kind of a game worth playing. Um, and a lot of the things that will kind of like define and kind of like, um, like, actually allow crypto games to be like, you know, like a differentiated game. And it's like a, like basically being a, like a paradigm shift is like everything that comes beyond that. Right. So like, I think like when I think about, oh, like, look at this game, it has like smooth onboarding and like, why are we talking about this? This is like table stakes. Right. And so like, um, and like, that's like really why I think like, um, I think like, I, I think it's just like, I think like this whole like onboarding spiel is like, is like I think like sometimes like overblast. Like I think we should like um, we should like do this obviously because it's the table stakes, but it's not really a destination. Um, but like yeah, I love hearing uh, your your point there because when you zoom out, I think that really shows where we are with crypto gaming today, right? Like that that's the priority is making a sweet onboarding process. When you yeah. think about that, like yes, I think it should be smooth and easy for the user. But I guess there's like a school of thought that kind of seems to be prevailing and for logical reason is the user shouldn't really know the game is on chain. Is that kind of the goal you're building towards? Or do you think there's like somewhere a different landing space in, on, on the spectrum that still makes sense where, yeah, it feels like a crypto game, but it's easy to do. And that's probably a good thing for the, like a, some sort of different reason. Like, how do you feel about the game actually feeling like it's on chain? Yeah, so I think like... The key thing here is that I think like there is like some sort of like more nuance to this, right? There is, I think, two kinds of crypto gaming companies in crypto. Um, there are crypto gaming companies that are embarrassed that they are a crypto gaming company. Um, and then there are kind of like crypto gaming company that is not as shy or just, they're just not embarrassed. They're proud that they're a crypto gaming company, right? Um, and a lot of the crypto games that I would say like the Web 2.5 game, um, they're kind of like sometimes like embarrassed. Like if you just like see like like the way that they do comms and like, you know, like this is a technical podcast. So I'll just kind of be frank here, right? That this is like, um, like they, they would sometimes like kind of just like, oh, like, you know, like we are an NFT, but we only do NFT very little. Like, you know, where our focus is building a great game and like they kind of try to sweep it under the rug and kind of they just like try to not mention it or they kind of like put NFT in a very convoluted way that you are barely like, like able to figure out that it's a blockchain inside of it. Um, or like sometimes like, you know, they would just like, oh, like, you know, they would just like even not have any mention of crypto or blockchain from their website, right? Because they're trying to play this arbitrage of like, you know, like, oh, the users, like whatever. Um, 
And then again, there are kind of companies on the other hand who really is like, and like kind of identify as crypto or blockchain company. Uh, and the, the problem here is that people see this as too, ex like, as like, it's like kind of like a mutually exclusive, like, uh, like, you know, like diagram that like, Hey, if you are like, you know, a crypto gaming company, you identify as a crypto gaming company. That means that, um, that means that your onboarding is going to be shit because like, um, you only care about the crypto part and you don't un like, you don't understand real users. And this is like, kind of like, I think like a dumb, like, you know, like kind of like, you know, like way to argue, right. It, because like, just because you are proud and like, you just like want to like, you know, actually be maximally on chain, like, just because you want to like push the plot in terms of like how the crypto games are integrating with blockchains, doesn't necessarily mean that that needs to be a sacrifice of the user experience. Right. And so this is like kind of the work that we do um, on the infrastructure side at Argus is really like, let's build blockchains that are actually, you know, like designed from first principles from the players, right? Again, um, like not a lot of companies are able to do this, like, you know, basically kind of designing their own blockchain whatsoever. And so I think like we're very fortunate um, to be able to do that. Um, but like, yeah, I think in general, like, I think like we just like reject this kind of dichotomy of like, um, if you're kind of a crypto gaming company and you want to do things on chain, that means that you're going to ignore the, the, the real users or like, you know, you're going to like exclude the mass, like the mass market. Um, I just don't think that dichotomy should exist. Right. In the same way that when like the internet first exists, like, um, like, like we don't kind of build like email apps or like we don't build websites by kind of like intentionally saying that, Hey, like we will, um, do whatever it takes to make sure the normies cannot use it, right? But it's still kind of maximally internet, right? Like, you, like just because, like, you know, oh, it's like, just because it's like using the internet more doesn't mean that it's like trying to kind of like exclude um, kind of like, you know, the normal users or the traditional users, right? And so like, um, and so like, I think like there is kind of really smart ways to kind of like navigate this. And I think like, um, like I think the black and white approach is of like, oh, like you either be a crypto gaming company that is on chain and like whatsoever and like have bad user experience versus like the ignore crypto and be a normal web 2.5 game is like, I think that's a very, very kind of wealth spectrum. And so like, that's really kind of why I'm like, uh, eh, like, but like, yeah, I think like, that's kind of my, kind of like the point. <laughs> That makes sense. Kind of trying to walk that fine line between the two is probably very difficult, but I do want to zoom out a little bit here just for the audience who's not familiar. Uh, Scott and a couple other buddies uh, made the first uh, fully on-chain MMORTS game uh, using ZK Snarks, I believe, which I can't even imagine how difficult that was back in the day with the lack of documentation in 2020. But uh, nevertheless, you ran into some huge problems on a chain called XDI, which is now Gnosis, I believe. Um, and basically you were filling up all of the blocks and like, it just didn't have the capacity to handle the fully on chain aspect of the game, which led you to build Argus today. So what were the primary problems specifically that you identified that you are incorporating in world engine to help, uh, I guess, make those problems more easily navigatable for game developers on Argus. Yeah. So I think like the problem here is like really kind of like twofold, right? I think like. Uh, first and foremost, there is kind of like just like the very pure um, game developer problem. Um, and that part of the problem is just really simple. It's like, um, like it's like really hard to build uh, like like a, like a fully on chain, like fully on chain game, like um, like Solidity and smart contracts. Um, they were really never designed to run kind of these like uh, like game like behavior, right? Um, like like a blockchain, like, I think like smart contracts are kind of like first and foremost are like basically what we like to call event driven. So it's like very good for things that are like transaction in nature. It is like a transaction oriented. Let's say you want to make a swap, like you, you want to make, um, let's say a, a token transfer. These are things that are transaction driven. There's like event driven. There's like a, a very explicit user action, um, that they're trying to complete. And then the program, uh, creates a side effect, right? Um, games are very different. Um, like, um, like this is like why, like you don't, you, you don't see people build it using kind of like web frameworks to build games, right? They have their own like cluster of toolings and framework and like game engines. Like this is like a manifestation is like game engines because they're such a different kind of software. Um, they need to kind of like, you know, basically like, like a runtime that behaves very differently than like a normal, like, you know, web server. This is like why, like, you know, most games cannot run using like 
um, you cannot have like a normal like Node.js backend, right? Because like um, it functions like very differently in nature. Um, and so that's like kind of like the biggest problem, right? Like the smart contracts are like an event-driven runtime and like games are what we like to call like loop-driven, um, where like even without user input, like the game time moves forward, right? And so um, that's like one thing. The second part is really kind of just about scale, right? Um, like blockchains again are like, you know, like back in like 2018, like we really started with like, you know, when Ethereum first just coming, uh, start, start to kind of like become popular, there's more people building smart contracts. Um, like the way that we're using these smart contracts are very, very primitive, right? Uh, when we start building games like Dark Forest, um, like we start to kind of really push the limit of like, um, like what, like, you know, like the state machine can handle, right? Like every single transaction in the Dark Forest was like a move on chain. And therefore there needs to be computation that is being done that. Um, and so this le uh, le reach a lot of these, like, you know, like basically just like performance bottleneck of the EVM um, and like so on and so forth. And so what we do at Argus to kind of really solve like these, like um, the kind of the basically developer experience problem is we built a roll-up framework um, to that is specifically designed from the bottom up for games. Um, and like one of the key feature of this like roll-up framework is that we have what we call like a world sharding system. Um, so the world sharding system is inspired by kind of the uh, server architecture of like massively multiplayer online, uh, like, you know, like, you know, like game, right? So like, uh, like World of Warcraft, uh, RuneScape, what have you, they have this concept called like sharding, right? And this is like kind of like completely, trust me, this is like completely different than like the Ethereum sharding and like whatsoever it is. It's like arguably like, you know, it was like some people claim that this is like the MMO game architecture is like where the word sharding even, you know, came originally before like, you know, these Ethereum sharding or even database sharding, right? Um, but like, yeah, like sharding, like world sharding basically means like, let's say you have um, like, kind of like, let's say, um, like, let's say you have a map and you have like an X, Y kind of like, you know, like, you know, like an axis. Um, and like, in like by using the X and Y axis, you can make four quadrants, right? Like the negative, like you know, quadrant, like negative, pos like no, positive quadrant, negative, negative quadrant, positive, negative quadrant, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the key thing here is that like, if you have these like four quadrants, maybe you can like split the game server or the game world into four different chunks, like one for each quadrant, right? Such that like, you don't need a single server or you don't need single to like handle all the players in all quadrants. And then you can also like, let's say you have more players, right? Like you now like have more scale, you have more player concentration. Maybe you can start splitting it off to like smaller shards and smaller quadrants, right? And so this is like what the, basically the whole concept of like, you know, like world sharding um, comes into play, right? Is that instead of like having one single, um, like, you know, server to handle all of the game computation, you have these like smaller, like, you know, or you, you have these like, you know, like, you know, independent, like, you know, server that kind of like basically um, handle the aggregate player load by kind of distributing it, um, like you do, like kind of just like based on like the in-game map or based on just like, let's say, um, like, you know, just like, let's say matchmaking and so on and so forth, right? And so this is like a really powerful tool and server architecture that multiplayer games like today are, are able to use, right? Like this is like why games are able to scale up and down, like, you know, very aggressively based on their user count, right? Because again, like the, people don't play games 24 seven or like around the world. Some games are only popular in the U S so they have like peak user counts in the U S and like less users in like, um, and like, let's say Indonesia or like Asia, because like, you know, like they're not catered to that audience and et cetera. Um, and so this is like a really powerful tool to scale, like, you know, um, kind of game architectures. However, like, again, we don't really have the co this concept in like the blockchain, right? Um, and so like what we did was like basically take that server architecture and use that as an inspiration for our rollup framework. And so in our rollup framework, we have an EVM base chart that really provides this like base interoperability layer and this like where the economy or like interoperability and composability will, will happen. So if you want to have an NFT marketplace, you want to have like, um, like, you know, basically game transactions, you want to have guilds, like guild systems or like whatsoever, that would all happen in the EVM base chart. Um, but everything that is like related to the game computation or anything, any heavy computation that you want to like, kind of like basically, um, you know, remove from the EVM, you can like let the game shards run it. And the best thing about the game shard is, as I, I said before, you can run multiple of them. Like you can run like a hundred of them in parallel. 
and that will allow you to like horizontally scale your game. And let, if, let's say like, oh, like you now like want to like, you know, you have 100 game shards that's running in parallel and now you need more scale, then all you need to do is just like run more game shards. And like now you are able to distribute more users to those like, you know, like extra game shards. Um, and so this would also solve like, you know, basically the third problem with like um, that we have with like Dark Forest, right? Where in like when we had like this influx of user, um, like back in the day, we just simply could not could not handle more of those users and we have to start rejecting those players, right? Which is like, of course, bad for business if like we're thinking about it from a business sense, right? Um, and so like by doing this, like we're basically able to guarantee like that if we are building a fully on-chain game, we don't have to make a trade-off of like accessibility, right? We are not going to have to make a trade-off of like, hey, if we make this like game fully on-chain, then we are going to... We have to face the reality that we'll, we'll ne we will never be able to scale beyond than like what a normal traditional EVM rollup are, are able to handle, which is like not a lot. Like a lot of people think that rollup cures cancer. Like oh, like just because we have rollup, we can do like um, Facebook scale, like you know, like you know, like you know, like traffic flow. We can do um, like whatever, but that that is really not the case, right? And so like to really achieve that like level next level of scale, um, there needs to be kind of these like Kind of like horizontally scaling kind of like um like you know architecture that we need to incorporate um to be able to support that and so that's like really kind of like where the world engine comes into play and so um so like yeah okay yeah first of all let them know scott let them know roll-ups do not cure cancer i love that <laughs> <laughs> um i was actually just joking with the rest of the team today about that exact point but going back to the execution sharding environment i really liked your analogy with the the user map and, and breaking that into four quadrants my question would be like so if each of those quadrants is running within their own game shard, what does it look like for the user when, let's say, they cross over from the double positive quadrant to the double negative quadrant? Like, what does actually crossing that imaginary line look like to the user? Yep. Yeah, and so this is a kind of like kind of this is like kind of a key kind of like game question, right? Uh, like this is like a game design question at the end of the day because like all of this happens on the client side. Um, in the same in the same like in the same way that let's say you're playing World of Warcraft, right? Um, like World of Warcraft map is like really, really huge. Um, and so like the way that they kind of like split off the quadrant is like sometimes like, you know, oh, let's say like you're moving from one section of the map to like another. And so you would have kind of like, oh, like you can like basically kind of like teleport to this like new quadrant of the map or you're teleporting to a new part of the map, right? Um, or like, let's say you are kind of like, um, like like a lot of modern MMORPG have like actually seamless like you know like you know like seamless like you know loading between like these like you know like um, like um, basically across shards right and so these are things that you can do right there is a lot of really kind of like this is again like like the key thing here is that like I have to admit like you know like I'm not like inventing like rocket science here right like um, like my job is to like really kind of takes into like the learnings that like our team have building distributed systems, building these like large scale systems for like, you know, video games and like, you know, incorporating our know-how from the blockchain and kind of synthesizing that, right? There's like no original kind of idea, like, you know, at its core, um, because like, it's all just like decades of like, you know, like, you know, MMO architecture, like, you know, people have spent like countless hours optimizing it. And so there's no really a reason for us to like reinvent everything from scratch. Um, and like these people trust me, like, you know, the games people like, you know, play, people don't really think about like video games as shelling point for like, you know, excellent in, like software engineering for and distributed systems architecture. But like some of the things that people do, like in terms of like network optimization and net codes, um, that is like where like, you know, the best people like, you know, like work at is like these like video games company building these like large scale, like, you know, MMO games. And so that is kind of basically kind of like what we're kind of like running with. And so like, um, again, we've had a lot of learnings from existing kind of like MMO games where like you can have like these like seamless, um, like kind of just like, oh, you can just walk to a map like seamlessly and you just don't even know like that you are now in a different like, you know, shard. It just like happens there. There's like a cross shard communication like happening where just like, hey, like, you know, right before you cross, you're already giving a heads up to like, you know, the the kind of the other shard that there is a possibility that this like player is going to um, like, you know, move to your shard. Here is here play, here is their player data in advance. So there's no lag at all. Like when you're kind of like, you know, like when you're actually committing that this like player is now in your in your shard. 
And so like that is kind of like the same things that we want to get to like, you know, with the world engine as well. Um, you like, and because like at the end of the day, we see ourselves as a gaming company. We want to build these kind of like, you know, like large scale MMO games that, um, as well. And like, this is like, just like the ingredients for us to get there. And along the way, like, you know, people are able to act, get access to the same technology that we're using to build our own games. Yeah. Okay. That's super helpful context. I have a couple one Oh one questions for you. So does the base shard settle to Ethereum or is it its own, uh, L1? Yeah, so the base shard is like a rollup, so it settles to like um, so Ethereum uh, for our case, but it can technically settle to like anywhere. Um, like if you want to make it settle to like Solana, you can want to make it settle to like um, like you know Binance Smart Chain, Polygon. Nothing really stops you from doing that. Um, we kind of like just like see like you know Ethereum as like a great shelling point for a lot of the existing kind of like um, like you know basically attention and kind of like you know basically and like like, you know, like security and like crypto and et cetera. And that's really kind of why we make that decision personally for us. But at the end of the day, World Engine is like an open source, like, like kind of like SDK. Um, and we want to have people like actually be able to experiment and like settle in like different, um, like different, like, you know, chain, um, wherever their community is, right? Because at the end of the day, like, um, like that's like one thing that you should kind of like basically kind of like prioritize is like where your audience is, right? If your audience is like, let's say, um, you already have like a strong audience in Solana. You don't have to like migrate off to like Ethereum. You don't have to like migrate off to like, you know, some like random chain. Like you should just like bring um, like, you know, the game to them. And then in our case, like, you know, you can do this like, um, like, you know, by being kind of like a separate, like, you know, modular chain essentially. Okay. And then there's this concept and I don't really know how exactly this relates to like blockchain games in particular, but like if I'm playing Fortnite and I'm in like an Asian region and then, uh, my ping will be higher, but yeah. if I'm playing in the U S region, like it's better. How does this play into the context of Argus? Like, is that going to yep. be a problem? Do you think? Yep. Um, so that's a very great question. And this is like actually one of the, one of the, like basically one of the, like, I think like side effects that like we, like, like we kind of like realize in hindsight uh, as we were really designing the role engine like sharding act architecture that is like really really useful um for the game developers right because like um at the end of the day it really depends on the kind of game that you're trying to build um but like in in, in the scenario for like most modern games like ping or like latency to like the like the game like backend is like really really important right and so in our case like we want to make like in, in our case like you know by using a game shark we're able to kind of basically geolocalize. Uh, I think the word the word is like geolocalize your game shard, your game backend, essentially to wherever it is like closest to your users, right? And so like you can have like you know if you play League of Legends or you play Valorant, you typically see like US West and US East, uh, and then like you can see like Southeast Asia, like and then like you know let's say like um, like you know Eastern Europe or like you know and like Western Europe and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is like a really powerful tool that now we have access to because we can bring kind of these like, you know, like basically roll up sequencers, like these roll up nodes closer to the user, the game shards closer to the user to make sure that they have these like seamless um, play experience. Right. Um, and so like the reason why this is important is, of course, um, if you're building real time games, right, if you're building games that are like, let's say, um, like even like hell, like, you know, games that are fair, like looks very simple in like the surface, like a Gar IO, right? Like, you know, you, you know, Gar IO, the game that where you just like, kind of like, it's a very simple game. You're just kind of eating this, like, you know, like it's like a snake, but like real time and like whatever is multiplayer. Um, and like those game is like going to be unplayable with 200 millisecond thing. Like if you play a Gar IO with like, um, with let's say like uh, with a Southeast Asia server from the US, like you're not gonna have a great time. You're gonna like stutter, you're gonna like teleport and like you're gonna, you know, basically die like, you know, like out of nowhere because like someone ate you and you didn't see it for after like the next 200 milliseconds. So like that is like an issue like for, for games, right? And this is like why you need like, you know, geolocalization, you need to actually have a server that, or you have, you need to have a backend, you have to like have like these like game shards uh, as close as, you, as like to the user as you want to be um, if you are building a real-time game. But again, if you're building a chess game, it doesn't really matter because like chess moves, like you could take one second to like, you know, send the chess move and it would be fine. But it's a completely different story if you want to build um, like 
you know, like significantly like more like powerful, like more real time and more dynamic games. Like fighting games, for instance, like they are very, very like latency sensitive. Like even, like they are probably like one of the most like uh, the hardest game to build a multiplayer like you know like architecture for. Um, because they're just like so latency sensitive, right? Imagine you're playing Super Smash Bros and like your opponent is like 100 millisecond like behind and they're just like starting to lagging and teleport all over the place, then it's gonna be like super annoying, right? Um, and so that is like the key thing why like um, just like this like proximity, um, like kind of like, you know, basically to the sequencer, the game shard is like really important. Um, and it's like one of the benefit of like having these like sharding, like sharding system as well. You can have like a single base shard that is, let's say, like, you know, again, like the base shard could be anywhere. Um, then the game shard is like you bring that closest to the to the kind of like the user as possible. And let's say you have an influx of users in Asia, then you can spit up more game shards in Asia. And then like, let's say you like, and then like, let's say like, like EU starts growing and then you can spin more game shards in EU and then kind of adjust accordingly, right? Um, and so like, that's like kind of like really cool part of kind of like the game chart architecture as well. All right, Zero X research listeners, we're calling on you to join us for the premier institutional crypto conference in Europe's crypto capital, London, this March, 2024. You're going to get to hear exclusive insights from industry trailblazers on things like leveraging DeFi protocols for institutional yield, tokenizing real world assets with instant settlement, navigating the evolving global regulatory landscape, integrating digital assets into banking and payments, or crafting institutional investment mandates with digital assets as the key focus. We'll also be featuring some big keynote speakers, including Melvin Dang, the CEO at QCP Capital, Mark Yusko, the CEO and managing partner of Morgan Creek Capital, and Stani Kluchin, the founder and CEO of Ave Companies. This is not an event you're going to want to miss. Seats are limited, so be sure to register today by hitting the link in the description and using promo code 0x20 to save 20% on your tickets. See you in London, the land of tasty pastries, and be sure to hit up Dan and I for a beer. So I just want to double down on the architecture here just to make sure I understand it from more of like the the crypto native perspective. So um, it sounds like the base shard of Argus is a ETH rollup that as its settlement uh, does settles down to Ethereum. So I'm assuming that's where the bridge contract is. Um, what about data availability? Are you posting DA to Ethereum or is that to another one of the newer solutions? Yeah, so that's a great question, right? So we are using Celestia as a data availability layer. Uh, but again, like um, as a framework, there's really nothing we can stop users from like, you know, um, using kind of like um, like an alternate DA or choice or even just like using kind of like ETH L1 DA. Um, like our experience that is just like, like ETH L1 DA is just like way too expensive for games. And so this is like where like um, the search for an alternative DA solutions are like, are like kind of like very important, right? And so... Um, this is like kind of like one of the things that we kind of like we're optimizing for and just like make sure that like, you know, we are able to serve like, you know, these like seamless like um, gaming experience to the user is like finding a way to get um, like cheap data availability, right? Um, because that is like really the only like bottleneck left that we have in like building fully on chain games is like, is just like getting these access to cheap like data availability layer. Because now that we have like the world engine, like compute is like no longer a problem because like every time you need more compute, just spin up more game shards. You're never gonna run out of compute. The only kind of like, you know, like bottleneck right now here is like, how do you kind of like have these like, you know, basically uh, call data, you know, like bandwidth to like, you know, stream these like, you know, trans like roll up transactions, right? Um, and so like, that's kind of like basically um, where like, you know, we found Celestia to be like an amazing solution and like when we were running like, you know, kind of like Dark Frontier on like, you know, basically Celestia, we've ran this for like almost like one and a half week now. Um, we're basically able to like kind of like minimize costs on like many order of magnitudes to the point that it doesn't even matter if like, you know, the game developers just pay for like the entire cost themselves. Um, and so that is like really kind of like a world that we're kind of living in now where like compute is abundant and like, you know, um, now the data availability cost is like be getting abundant as well. And like, this is like where like, you know, building increasingly on-chain game um, is like no longer becomes like a ball neck, right? It now just become, it just comes down to like unlocking and providing these like, um, like, you know, tools to game developers so they can easily do that and kind of like, like dispel this kind of like mid aura of like, skepticism or like you know just like lack of understanding or like so on and so forth 
Um, because like we now have the technology to build um, like these like seamless like you know on chain games um, like you know wherever in the spectrum you want to be let it be fully on chain or like partially on chain or what have you. Okay, that's super super interesting because obviously uh, the release of Celestia and even something like Eigen DA, you know, it really does reduce the A cost by about ninety nine percent, which is significant. So I, I liked your acknowledgement that DA is kind of becoming abundant. Uh, so just one more question on kind of the the architecture side here. Um, so we have a like, can you just describe how the execution environments exist? Like, are those kind of like uh, roll ups on top of the base shard, or, or what, what? Like, what's the design there? Yeah, so for the game shard itself, um, like so, we we our game shard is called Cardinal, right? Um, the key thing with Cardinal is that it's 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 not EVM, right? That's like one of the key thing that I just like want to highlight first. Um, so the game shard itself is not EVM. It, it interoperates like you know the EVM base shard are able to like access the data and like trigger transactions in the game shard, but the game shard itself is not. Is not EVM. It's like our own like state machine that we designed from scratch uh, specifically to run like you know game computations. Uh, and this is like, basically kind of the key thing that we were like we like we we need to do because like again like as I mentioned before, the EVM wasn't just like a runtime that is like designed to run games. There's just not a world uh, in where I imagine like you know again I spent I'm like an EVM dev like you know I came from EVM. That's really kind of my background. Um, I did like, you know, everything from like smart contract engineering to like smart contract auditing. Um, and like throughout that process, like I just, I just realized that like, you know, if you want to build like expressive games, like you, you cannot be stuck in that kind of these like very vanilla runtime. Right. And I think like, I'm dreaming of a future where like, you know, you are designing like, you know, state machines and applications around like, you know, around the kind of use case that you want to do instead of a shoehorning like a VM or shoehorning like an existing kind of like um, a state machine or framework against like, oh, like this will cure all cancer, right? And this is, I think like, you know, kind of like the, I, I keep using this because that is the reality of like blockchain, right? This is like how like most blockchain companies, more, most infrastructure companies are able to like, oh, get the largest total addressable market as possible is by building infrastructure that solves all people's solution, right? They will like, oh, I built this like infrastructure. This will like solve cancer. This will cure like malaria and like whatever. It's like, it's like, this is kind of really kind of the problem with infrastructure companies is that they always think about their product as like a cure all solution for everything. Well, in reality, this is not like how like, you know, like how like applications or softwares are developed. You don't see like Google Sheets coming out like, hey, like, um, like Google Sheets will, uh, will like help you build on chain games. Like, you know, Google Sheets, like use Google Sheets for a spreadsheet, right? Um, and so like, that is kind of like basically how we think about like the Cardinal, like, like you know, like runtime or the Cardinal, like, like you know, game shard as well. Like it's like a, a kind of a Go-based state machine that does like only, and like we focus simply on like using that to build um, like games. And so all those, goes, uh, all those, those game computations happen within this like, you know, game shards, right? And so like we, uh, the game shards have this like um, like basically kind of data structure slash kind of like design pattern called entity component system. Um, so entity uh, entity is basically kind of just a game like entity or data object components are the kind of like this like data that is attached to that entity. Um, and then system is like the business logic. It's really kind of the the kind of the computation that drives the game computation, right? So the system could be like, let's say a physics system, right? Like, let's say you have like, you can have a gravity system that applies, you know, like, you know, a, you know, a downward, like, like acceleration or for like all objects to make sure that like, let's say you have like a like object that's currently floating in the air because there's a gravity system, those like objects like fall down into the ground. Um, you could have like, let's say combat system that handles like inflicting damages or like, you know, like regeneration for like the users. And so that's like really like that's the kind of like a very common pattern that like you know game developers are familiar with, and we just kind of like bring that same like you know pattern into uh, into like kind of the cardinal game shard. And so like basically what we do with the game shard is that we make sure that we provide like a developer experience uh, and like kind of like and design patterns that the game developers are most familiar with, and they no longer have to like basically like pull like the stun maneuvers that we have to do with dark forest right like you know when we like when i was like writing a smart contract for dark forest we had to like basically like 
um, pull this like, you know, like crazy, like kind of like workarounds or they kind of like do this crazy hacks to just make the smart contract works. Now with the kind of game shark, you no longer have to do that because that's really kind of like what the runtime, that's like what the state machine is designed to do. And so you are basically able to do virtually anything that you would want to do in the nor like traditional kind of like client side game engine, like Unity and Unreal. Um, and so that's like basically kind of like what we do with the, with the game shark. And so the game shark itself, I think like some people often confuses it as like an L3 uh, on top of like, you know, the ABM base shard, but that's like kind of like, you know, uh, that's like not like what the game shard is, right? So like the way that we like to think about the game shard is, is like basically as like parallel, parallel one times. So instead of like sitting, uh, having the game shard sits on top of the roll up as an L3, um, the, the game shards exist as like basically a part of an L2. So you're, uh, you're basically kind of making the L2 like, you know, like kind of like basically more expensive instead of like only having EVM, like you're only running an EVM, like, you know, like, you know, like state machine or you're only running an EVM runtime. The, the, like the layer two is now running these like game shards, like, you know, it's like, and like these game shards can have different games on it and whatsoever, but it all like exists as a part of L2. And this gives us a lot of the benefits. The first one is, of course, like we have like seamless interoperability and like composability across these two, um, these two, like these kind of like, you know, the base shard and the game shard and the game shards to the other game shards, because it's not like as an independent blockchain. They are just like a part of the same blockchain. And like by using like EVM precompiles, they're able to access each other's data like seamlessly. Um, like if we contrast this to, let's say, with like an L3, what you will notice happen is that like the moment that you want to access the state of like, let's say like, like kind of like say you have an L2 and then you have an L3, like when you want to access the state of the L3, you can't do that seamlessly from the L2, right? Like if let's say the L3 is an optimistic, like, um, you know, like an optimistic L3, then you have to wait like the seven days challenge period for you to even, even get the data back. Right. Like, um, and like, you know, so that's like kind of the key construction that we were, we, we make is that like, we don't want these like game shards to exist as like a separate layer of rollup. Um, we want this to just be a part of like, you know, the layer two itself. So you can think about it as like a layer two that just like half, like, you know, many different kind of like, you know, like, you know, like parallel runtimes running on top of it. And it just like kind of exists as like a singular, like, you know, like, you know, like kind of like a singular kind of like uh, chain onto itself. Yeah. Okay. That's a, uh... Sam, I, I want you to take it away here, but I, that was so that's what I was trying to. I you mentioned that people uh, probably misconceive it as an L three, and that's what it was in my head. So when I was even asking that first question about like crossing that imaginary border from quadrant A to quadrant B, it's like, well, what does that look like? Because in my head, I'm like, there needs to be some sort of transaction. Like that's a huge pain in the ass. It's definitely async, but this is an awesome way that you guys are solving it. But please, Sam, take it away. Yeah. Yeah, I just I, I'm trying to conceptualize it in my head as well, because when I logged into Dark Frontier, I, I just put in my email address and then there's a little box that says enter your, you know, actual Ethereum address and then you can withdraw assets down to the base shard. So can you just kind of like provide more color on what that will look like? Because obviously in Dark Frontier, I don't think there's anything that you can actually withdraw down to the base shard today, unless I'm mistaken. But um, yeah, just elaborate on that. Yeah, so like basically the game shard is like the game shard is like has their own like identity system, right? So like uh, we call this persona, uh, and so the reason why we even built this like account system or identity system from scratch is just like we think like it, like you know we just think like blockchain addresses is just like something that like is like onto itself a UX problem, right? Like you know it's really hard to reason about these like zero x like whatever addresses. And so like a persona tag is basically like a human readable, like, you know, username or gamer tag if you are like, a, like, you know, an Xbox player. Right. Um, and so that's really kind of like what this like persona tag is all about. And this is like how like the, the cardinal game shards, like understand your player identity. Um, and like, this is of course, like, you know, like we'll kind of like transfer or like, you know, all the game shards will be able to understand this like game identity that you have. Right. Um, and so the key thing here is that we still are able to kind of like use the EVM to like, like you, you can use your EVM account to authenticate and use your, uh, your persona accounts. So like, you know, let's say you want to make, uh, let's say you have a smart contract on Ethereum or you have like, you know, again, the wallet on the EVM base chart, um, you can make uh, transactions and moves um, using your EVM address. And so this is like where your account linking um, will kind of basically kind of like come into play 
Um, and this is like where a lot of these kind of composability element will kind of like really like, I think like there's a lot of composable experiments that we are kind of really fascinated by it, right? So for instance, like some people are experimenting with the idea of like letting a smart contract own a persona. And so like by letting a, a smart contract own a persona, you can do like some sort of a guilt player, right? Like where instead of like having one person control the account, you can have a guilt which is represented by a smart contract controlled by it, control the account. And so that's like basically kind of like how these like persona system works, right? It's like basically like abstract, it's like a kind of abstraction construction that we designed from scratch for like, you know, game use cases. So instead of like, oh, having these like blue sky kind of like, um, like, you know, like problem where like, oh, like we have these like people you trying to use DeFi apps, like using a kind of abstraction or whatsoever. We just think like very simple, right? Okay. Like how are users going to want to do uh, account abstraction for um, like, you know, for games. And that's like basically kind of like what we design um, like all of this, like these like persona system for, um, but like, yeah. So let's like, you know, let's say like, you know, a smart contract wants to make a move like from the EVM base shard to like the game shard, all you need to do is like literally call like, you know, a, like, you know, basically a pre-compile on the EVM base shard, which is like basically like calling another smart contract in the base shard and that will basically kind of like send a communication to like kind of like send a transaction package um, to like the, the game shard that they want. And then that, that will just like be processed automatically uh, by the game shard and they will kind of like return a value and whatsoever. And so like, yeah, it's like basically like, like the same blockchain. It's like, we're just like basically building these like um, abstraction layers for like, you know, the base shard and the game shard to communicate with each other. Um, um, which we call riff, but like that's like a separate conversation for another time. It's like like an hour talk onto itself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll spare you on that one. Maybe we'll have to get you back for another episode in the future to talk about that. But I do want to ask too. It sounds like there's like a shitload of stuff that needs to get built out, and like there's going to be a like a kind of an element of Lindy if you can get enough developers and users onboarded to kind of fix stuff and provide more tooling, build more cool games, etc. So, what's your strategy for actually? attracting those developers like a lot of projects will launch a token or maybe they'll have like a dollar denominated grants fund do you have have you guys thought about that at all yet yeah um that's a very interesting trap question not just kidding <laughs> uh but like uh, <laughs> give people what they want scott <laughs> uh but like but like yeah my quick answer here is like um like we're building this for ourselves first and foremost right like we're not building this as like oh we want to trying to be a pick and shovel company like we have some things to sell like a Again, like our motivation in building kind of all these stack is like really just like we want to build great games, right? And like, um, and like at the end of the day, of like if we have are able to attract these like developer ecosystem of like you know people building on top of the world engine, contributing to open source, building plugins for the world engine, building extensions, tooling in the world engine, we as a game developer and as a game publisher also benefits because like now we have you know, larger access of like, you know, like, you know, mindshare and kind of just like basically people like, you know, loving to use like our engine, right? And so that is kind of like basically like our kind of like, you know, like way of reasoning about this in the first place, right? Is that like, we don't feel like, oh, we, we have to like basically kind of like, you know, feel forced to like shill it or like whatsoever. Because again, at the end of the day, are the primary users of this infrastructure is ourselves. We are not building this infrastructure for like a third party. It's really kind of for us to solve our own problem. Uh, but in that process, we just realized that like, you know, people talk to us that like, hey, um, I really want to use this as well. And I'm happy to like contribute back to the community by building these like toolings and whatsoever. Um, and so I think that's like just like magical. Right. Um, but of course, like, again, like it's like it's like really powerful to just be able to like get more people um, to just like hop on the ecosystem because like um, there is like some like level, as you said, like kind of just like kind of these like activation energy before like people have these like documentations and the mind share and whatsoever. And so we're doing a lot of efforts just like kind of like onboarding developers to it and like helping them get started, helping them like port over the game that they have been building, um, like even like helping them like, you know, like basically get to production and like, you know, even like like helping them fundraise. Like I think like, you know, like a lot of people really try to like, all, like every time like people ask me and like, and they want to build a fully on chain game. Like they would ask me, like, "Hey, Scott, can you share your secret, like, fundraise, like, for a crypto game?" While everyone was like struggling and whatsoever. And so, like, we kind of like see that, like, kind of that as like kind of like where we want to be, like, you know, in the future as well, right? We want to be like essentially a game publisher where we can help like other game developers to like kind of like eventually publish their game and get funding for it, right? And so, um, and that's really kind of like all there is to it. Um, like you know, again, like we we don't really kind of like see. 
Um, we don't really kind of like want to like kind of make this as oh like an L1 kind of like ecosystem play where we were just like sh like throwing out grants and like tokens to a bunch of people. Um, and like at the because like, at the end of the day, like our goal here is to build great games um, and like you know help people like you know like you know publish their games and whatsoever. And so like we're just gonna do whatever it takes to like you know be able to do that. And like World Engine is like for us like a very pivotal part of that. That's awesome. It's uh, kind of refreshing to hear people talk about just building good games and, and not tokens or infrastructure for once. So I tip to you there. Is Dark uh, Frontier, like, do you suspect that will spin off into its own, like, community-owned game that, like, people will kind of build on and maybe iterate on potentially? Or is that something that you look to contribute to further? Or uh, what other games do you have in the pipeline, I suppose? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, like Dark Frontier for us is a, is a, is a, is a giant side quest, right? Um, like, you know, we are doing this to really kind of like figure out, like, and push, push the limit of like, you know, like, you know, our infrastructure and like first and, uh, and like first and foremost is also an homage to like, kind of like, um, kind of dark forest. Like, again, like I have, like, you know, I learned a lot from like, you know, building dark forest and like, you know, um, like, you know, the things that we we're building from Argus is really inspired for a lot of my work at like Dark Forest. And so like that is really kind of like what like, you know, Dark Frontier is going to be, right? It's like these like homage and really kind of these side, side quests for Argus. Um, and eventually, again, like our goal is to do the same thing that Dark Forest did, right? Like Dark Forest like was able to like hand off like, you know, their game to um, the community really well. They get like, you know, people like basically running their own rounds and games and like so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to open source the entirety of like Dark Frontier, like from the client to like, you know, the cardinal game short code that we wrote. And of course, the wall engine itself so that people can basically build their own like version and like kind of build their own remix of Dark Frontier. Um, like at the same time, we're also working on our own like kind of like larger flagship game. Unfortunately, uh, we, uh, we, I'm not allowed to really announce it yet. Um, like I'm technically the founder and CEO, but like I also have a team that will whip me if I kind of leak things too early um so like um so so like yeah i think like you know we we have like you know larger games that we're working on the pipeline um and like you know like some like really kind of we we have these like arcade drops like we like to call it is like think about it as games that you're able to like play for like you know five to ten minutes like when you're bored and so like you know we have a bunch of these games that are just like in the pipeline we're just like waiting to like release um but we were like okay let's do this like one at a time right and so like yeah, within the kind of like next few months, we'll kind of like have um, a bunch of these kind of like arcade drops. And then like, um, we're also working at kind of a larger uh, MMO game at the same time that like, you know, um, like we'll kind of like, you know, keep the audience like stay tuned to. Um, but like, um, but like, yeah, that's like kind of like our plans from here. Like we, um, for Dark Frontier, uh, we plan to kind of just like hand this off to the community. Uh, and like, we already have like um, several people reach out and like being interested to like run their own version of Dark Frontier uh, and like building your own like customization of Dark Frontier. And so like, we're just excited to see kind of like um, where it goes and I'm, we're happy, like we are happy to kind of support however we can um, on that front. Well, gosh, giving us, giving us a cliffhanger here. I love it. That's, <laughs> I, that's really exciting to hear that you have a ton of awesome things in the pipeline too. So yeah, that second episode is starting to, to starting to come into fruition already. Oh, um, man. You, you mentioned one thing that I want to dive a little deeper on. So you kind of mentioned how, dark frontier you really wanted to build it just to like push the limits of the system how do you yeah. how'd that go like how'd you feel about those results did you were you happy with like the throughput you could get and the smooth experience you could provide kind of yeah. shed some light on that um i'm i'm like honestly surprised that like that it works as smoothly as like <laughs> as it is like i was like expecting like honestly more like you know um like more fire and that was like and like honestly the original reason why we weren't running this through the holidays but we were, i'm just like afraid that like okay like uh, there might be a chance like you know there's like something we need to hop on but like luckily like you know it was really smooth sailing that like um, like people were like, finally, oh my God, finally we can like, you know, basically go to like our, like, you know, holiday, like, you know, like just like on like with peace. And so like, yeah, I think like in general, like, you know, we, we, we got a lot of like, you know, users to a point where like, um, it was like on a scale that, you know, again, dark forest was never, never really able to kind of really kind of like reach, um, with like, you know, basically performance that like, you know, again, like was like order of magnitude that we could like imagine and like. Uh, and like, yeah, I think like, I'm happy to just like also see that the users now are just like able to like onboard to the game, like much more easier, right? They don't have to worry about like gas anymore. 
and that, that's really kind of like my biggest like win I think so far is really dispelling the myth between like if you make an on-chain game it needs to be shit in terms of what your, your, your UX um that's like really kind of my biggest dub of this all is like really just like hey like you know some people just like straight up don't realize that this is an on-chain game but it is as on-chain that it could possibly get like literally every single move that you make on the game is an on-chain transaction um, but people don't even realize and think about it. And I think that's a huge win for me, right? And like, um, at the end of the day, like, you know, like the on-chain part is going to be interesting to some people. And like that will, in, like, it leads to like very interesting emergent behavior. Um, and like, that's like what I'm really excited about, right? But like, again, not everyone that plays the game needs to know about that side of the world. And like, to have to do that, to reach that point where just like completely seamless is like, is a win in my book, right? Um, and like in, in our scenario, like, you know, again, like if you're like kind of like playing Minecraft, like Minecraft can have modding and you can use like code and whatsoever to extend the game. But for a majority of players, you don't have to. But like for those that who do that do make mods, right, um, their impact, like, you know, not only impact themselves, but they also impact the rest of the community, the rest of the player base. And that's like how we think about on-chain games, right? Is that like people think that, oh, like, you know, why would the player care about, why, why would the majority of player care about these like on-chain and probability and composability? Like, no, it's like fine that like not everyone is gonna be able to understand and do that. Uh, the fact is like, there's gonna be like a small part of the player that does, and they're gonna improve the, like, you know, the playability and improve like, you know, um, you know, like entertain, like, you know, like hundreds and thousands of like, or like hundreds and thousands of like tens of thousands of users. And that's like a win in my book, right? In the same way in Roblox, not everyone in Roblox built their own games or like built their own like, you know, um, like, you know, like content and whatsoever. But those who do, like they are producing entertainment for like tens of thousands of people, right? And so that's like the way that I think about it. like, you know, these like on-chain games. So again, like, um, you know, like being fully on-chain, like being kind of like these like maximally, like, you know, like exploring the edge and pushing the plot of on-chain games doesn't have to come at a cost of like, you know, user experience, right? And so like, that's really kind of like um, our biggest takeaway from this so far is like literally, um, like I have like a journal of like, you know, wins of the week. And then like one of my wins is literally people don't realize this is a non-chain game. Um, and so like, and so that's like basically kind of how I think about it. Yeah, I was blown away at that. I like, it said fully on chain and I was like, but this is so smooth. Like I didn't connect a wallet. Like I was like confused. I was like, but I know it's got, like it's going to be fully on chain. So like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I have slacks from cool. Sam going, I don't believe it, man. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> Check the chain, yeah. right? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. So one last question. We're already at one o'clock and you've already been really generous with your time, but this is a quick question too. But how much like over the course of this week and a half since Dark Frontier lost has your total data posting cost been? It's it basically rounds down to like zero that we just didn't even track. <laughs> um, it's like I think like it's like very very minimal, right? It's just like basically like less than like it's less than like a hundred bucks. Like it's just like if we kind of like you know convert this into like kind of production kind of like scale and whatsoever and production kind of like you know networks. Um, it's basically a rounding error, like you know like in the grand scheme of things. Like this would have cost us like thousands of dollars if this was like um, like you know like main FDA, but like. Basically by like, you know, like using on Celestia, like the cost, like basically like rounds down to like, you know, practically zero for a company. And this is like why, again, like I'm saying, like, 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 on, like, the, like people always ask me, like, why on chain? Like, I think like within like, you know, like the next few months, like the question will no longer be like, why on chain? It's like, you know, like why not on chain? Right. Um, because it's just like, we're a reach a point where there's like, basically like, like, it's like, there's like almost like no, like reason not to build your game like fully on chain because like we solved the compute problem, we solved like developer experience problem, we solved the user experience problem. And now we have like, you know, these LDA solutions, like, you know, now we have like abundance of throughput as well. Um, and so like, yeah. Okay, I have one more question and then I promise it's the last question. But when you're talking to just whether it be friends, you know, well-educated, sophisticated people in web two or, or just anybody broadly, and they ask you, and you'd like say, oh yeah, I'm building crypto games on chain. What the, the first question I get every time when I mention crypto gaming is like, okay, well, what part of that is better than what exists today? What's your answer to that question? My answer to that is economic emergent behavior. My biggest thesis about like, um, like anything that is on chain really is economic emergent behavior. 
why is like Uniswap or why is Dexis or like why is like, you know, DeFi money markets better than like um, traditional finance? It's like the emergent behavior or like people building on top of those primitives, um, like building untroppable and composable smart contracts on top of those primitives that expands the economic GDP of like or the economic activity of like, you know, the network or the blockchain or whatever, whatever you want to call it. The same thesis that I have with like, you know, on-chain games is that like for every part that you have on chain, um, you will see emergent behavior forms around it. Uh, and like as like MMO game designers, we fascinate a lot in this concept of like emergent behavior because um, like because like that's like one of the magics when like, you know, like people start like, you know, building entertainment for themselves. Like, you know, you see like these user generated content, those are forms of emergent behaviors. Um, and the moment that you have emergent behavior, you as kind of like the creator of the game no longer have to like dog food content, like, you know, like to, to the kind of the users themselves, they will create entertainment onto itself. Um, and so we see primitive form of like emergent behavior in like existing MMOs. But now that we have like, you know, these like, you know, open, uh, like introbable, like smart contract layer, this is like where like, you know, these emergent behavior will kind of like compound. Like this is where like kind of like people will just have more design space to build things that like they have never been able to build in existing games before. And so like, I'm like very, very much like different than like the most like crypto games, like CEO, like I just like not like, I'm like not like very much like interested in like this idea of like, oh, ownership for the sake of ownership. I think ownership in a, in, in a vacuum is like useless, right? Like um, if, we want, if we want to talk about ownership, like, you know, like Steam Marketplace have like ownership of like, you know, you can have ownership of like, you know, skins and like, you know, like CSGO or like whatever, like you can buy and sell like, you know, these like skins on the Steam Marketplace or what have you, like those are kind of like ownership. Those are like just like NFTs, right? Like, but the magic of like, um, like, you know, like blockchain or like, you know, crypto games is the fact that your NFT can be used in any arbitrary like way that you want. You can like put it as like, a, I don't know, an NFT lending protocol. You can put it as like, put it on the NFT on like, let's say a guilt contract that they will kind of pay out returns to, or like they can like, you know, put it in an NFT bank or like whatever, right? And so these are kind of the beautiful thing that, um, that like, I think like, you know, what is exciting about on-chain games. So ownership for the sake of ownership is I think like really kind of like a very vague kind of like, I think like kind of like, you know, like I think like takeaway from like crypto games. What is I think the most beautiful, like, you know, like value add of like have, having anything on chain is the fact that like you will see people building on top of it, right? And this could be like anything from like the and the entire game state being fully on chain or just like, you know, the NFT being on chain. Like you will see emergent behavior form around anything that is like, you know, on chain data. Um, even like, you know, your like, you know, like DeFi shit coins, like, you know, there are emergent behaviors that forms around those like DeFi shit coins. Um, just by the fact that there is emergent, be like you, like the, the, the blockchain allows for this like permissionless emergent behavior. Um, and so that's like basically our like, you know, biggest thesis with like, uh, with like crypto games is like, how can we maximize emergent behavior? And most particularly, how can we explore um, these economic emergent behaviors to expand the economic activity and increase the GDP of the game. Because like one of the most frustrating things about like MMOs is that they like a lot of people like would research this economy and like, you know, like, like you know, these like MMO games and like whatsoever. And like the, the, the game developers or like the users just don't have that much tool to really expand or tap into this like growing economy of, of the game. And like the moment that you're able to do that, then I think you build something really magical. And I think that's like one thing that uh, crypto games need to lean on to is like kind of like encouraging this emergent behavior to form instead of like running away from it, right? I think like a lot of like, you know, crypto games are like shying away from like letting the users do anything with their game. And like, or like, you're like you know, let's just like do the most minimal form of crypto integration. Let's just do achievements on chain where like literally like, Sure, you can do emergent behavior uh, like over these achievements NFTs, but like it's really, really hard to like really kind of like think about like, you know, these like kind of like, you know, like these kind of like emergent behavior when you only have like very, very trivial state. But the moment that you have like, you know, very, very kind of like critical and like kind of like, you know, core game state, like, you know, that just opens the door for many, many more things. And I could go on about this for hours as well. <laughs> 
No, I love it. And honestly, Scott, we're going to have to do this again because I know Dan and I both still have a bunch of questions, but yeah. for the sake of your afternoon, uh, thanks so much yeah. for coming on. Do you want to tell people uh, where they can find you? And maybe if you have some, maybe it's a little too late, but I was going to say if you had some play codes for, for uh, Dark Frontier, we could drop them in the show notes, but I'll hand it over to you to say goodbye. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so like, yeah, like, so like, uh, you can like reach, uh, reach out to me on my social. I'm like very active on Twitter. So twitter.com slash like SM Sonardo. So like SM then my last name. Um, and then like, yeah, if you want to keep in touch about like Dark Frontier, uh, we're at like twitter.com slash Dark Frontier GG. Um, and like Argus is like at twitter.com slash Argus Labs underscore. Um, and so like, yeah, uh, uh, like, thanks for having me. And like, you know, this has been like a very great conversation. Awesome, man. We will catch you hopefully in the next few months. So thanks for coming on. Cheers, Scott. Cheers, yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning into today's episode. We hope you really enjoyed it. Wanted to take one more moment to remind you guys about our upcoming 2024 Digital Asset Summit in London this March. Seats are limited, so be sure to hit the link in the description and use promo code 0x20 to save 20% off on your ticket. We'll see you in London. Be sure to hit us up if you plan on attending.